Welcome to tonight's uh, panel discussion on um, the influence of Ronald Coase on economic policy in the next 50 years. I just want to say a few remarks for a, for a couple of minutes, uh, just to describe a couple of bookends, really. Uh, his, Ronald Coase's lecture on the theory of the firm, which won him his Nobel Prize, was given, I think, first in 1932, uh, when he was 22 years old. And I've always found it quite extraordinary that until a few months ago there was somebody alive who'd won a Nobel Prize for something he'd done um, back in, in 1932. Um, his book, uh, How China Became Capitalist, which was published by the IEA, he wrote when he was 101 and was published um, a, a couple of years ago. And he played a very active part in, in, in writing it, I can assure you. It's not just a name on, uh, on the cover. In fact, perhaps I could just um, relate a telephone conversation I, I had with him to... to um, indicate something about uh, Ronald Coase as a person. There might be people on the panel who, who met him and may have other uh, tales to tell. But the, the production of the book was really not handled in the uh, very best way by the um, publishers who, who worked uh, with us. And it was causing uh, Ronald Coase an awful lot of, of, of trouble, um, uh, upset and, and inconvenience. And I had to ring him uh, in, in, in Chicago and I've, I've met one or two Nobel Prize winners, but I'd never telephoned a 101-year-old Nobel Prize winner um, uh, bef before, so I, and, uh, who, who was uh, in an incre incredibly upset state because of the inconvenience he'd been put to. So I wasn't really, I, I was somewhat fearing this um, telephone conversation, and, and eventually uh, I plucked up the courage to uh, telephone him, he answered the phone, and he was just incredibly apologetic for the inconvenience that his book was causing the IEA. And um, uh, which I, I found uh, uh, quite extraordinary. And I think anybody else who's, who's met uh, Ronald Coase will relate the similar type of, of stories. Anyway, the purpose of the panel discussion is to um, provide uh, the, the insights of our experts on Ronald Coase, not my own relatively limited uh, insights. And in alphabetical order, and people will speak in alphabetical order, we have um, uh, Rupert Darwell from the Centre for Policy Studies, uh, Mark Pennington from the Department of uh, Political Economy uh, at King's College London, Martin Ricketts, who is a Professor of Economic Organisation at the University of Buckingham and Chairman of the IEA's Academic Advisory Council. Uh, Mark is also an IEA trustee. Uh, Cheto Vazhinovsky, who is an IEA author in areas such as, um, as uh, telecommunications and, and so on, and used to do the job that I do now, and is now a lawyer at Case Associates. And Richard Wellings, who is the IEA's Deputy uh, editorial director and an expert on transport economics as well as many other things. It's important that Ronald Coase does have an influence on economic policy making over the next 50 years because so far his influence has been, um, in this country at least, uh, very limited and hopefully uh, it can begin to correct the stunning lack of recognition of Ronald Coase and his achievements. Beyond listening, listing Coase as one of its Nobel Laureates, the LSE where Coase studied and taught has very little to say about him. And the neglect matters both for positive and negative reasons, which I'll come on to. But first I'd like to say something about uh, my discovery of this remarkable econom economist who has so much to teach us about the way the world works and how policy can help make it work a, a bit better. Unlike the distinguished academics here, I'm a practitioner. I'm a consumer of economics. <coughs> But I'd like to think that I have a, I'm fairly conversant in economic ideas and, and the people who generated those ideas. So let me confess that for most of my adult life, I've never heard of Ronald Coase, let alone have the faintest idea about his way of thinking about economic problems. My path began a little while ago with an article by Martin Wolfe in the Financial Times, in which Martin mentioned a book by Mansour Olson. I think, I think it was The uh, Logic of Collective, a uh, of Collective Action. So I got the book, and there's a passage in it mentioning cosy and bargains. What were cosy and bargains? I had to find out, and the more I learned, the more deeply uh, impressed I became with this remarkable economist and the insights which his thinking yielded. Before, econom before Coase, economists took firms for granted. Of course, firms have a critical role to play in Alfred Marshall's economics, but he didn't, or not, not to my knowledge anyway, ask why firms <coughs> existed. As Coase put it, why do co economists emphasise the role of prices and markets, yet within firms, the most significant players in the market, managers plan? 
Thanks to Coase, we all know now the answer, we know the answer, highlighting the role of transaction costs, or what he called the costs of using the price mechanism. The true genius of Coase, the mark of his huge originality, is delivering an insight that changes the way, the entire way we look at a problem. Once articulated, it becomes obvious. Coase's working method, his patient observation of economic and social phenomena, reminds me of Darwin's observations of natural phenomena, as anyone who's read The Voyage of the Be Beagle can testify. Perhaps it was an advantage that Coase was not formally trained as an economist, his refusal to be tied down by a preconceived opinion. Coase used to quote Thomas Kuhn, the historian of science, on how scientists clung to the prevailing paradigm. Coase was light years away from a paradigm hugger. He was about inventing, a par inventing new paradigms. And this is certainly the case with the way uh, uh, Coase overturned Pigou in his paper on the problem of social cost. When I first read the problem of social cost, it's a bold statement. You have to take account of the benefits as well as the costs of pollution or social nuisances. It took me back to a mind-numbing presentation given by the planners of the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, what is now known as HS1. The team from Union Railways, which was a public sector organisation, proudly boasted that the alignment that they'd uh, chosen, that they designed, involved knocking down only 11 properties. I remember thinking at the time, how much did it cost to avoid knocking down more houses? Wouldn't it have been cheaper to have paid the, the, the owners of these houses handsomely? Indeed, as I later discovered, for the railway's promoters and affected property owners to do some cosy and bargaining. What Coase recognised more fully than any economist since Adam Smith, who also, it should be noted, lectured on jurisprudence, is the importance of the institutions of the market, especially the legal system. Coase understood the profound importance of this much better than the economists advising the former countries of the communist bloc on their transition to being, becoming market economies. Without the appropriate institutions, he wrote, no market economy of any significance is, is possible. This brings me to the positive and the negative reasons why we in Britain need to know more about Ronald Coase and his approach to economic problem solving. I'll come to the positive one first. There are a host of policy areas that would benefit from a Coase approach. In some areas, Coase's ideas have been applied. The auction of 3G mobile spectrum in 2000, which raised £22.5 billion, was, is the best known example. But to, but to my mind, the outstanding example uh, for policy improvement is land use, liberalising our, our, our system of planning by allowing economic actors, property owners and property developers, to determine their own trade-offs. But I'll close my remarks with my, what might be called the negative reason, and possibly the more, more important one. I think it is the more important one. If policymakers do not understand the value of the institutions of the market, notably the common law, and the importance of respecting property rights, of due legal process, as contrasted with the administrative and regulatory state, then over time, the viability of those institutions will be compromised and eroded. And we risk losing an asset of extraordinary value because policymakers simply didn't realise what they were doing. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, in my remarks, I'm going to focus on the centrality of the transaction costs idea in the Cosian framework. Now, it's worth saying at the outset that there are some very, in very influential economists, uh, Nobel Prize winners indeed, who downplay, if not dismiss, Cosian's particular contributions in this area. According to this sort of a view, and it's a view associated with thinkers such as Joseph Stiglitz, the so-called Coe's theorem, which posits the relative efficiency of private ownership, is irrelevant <coughs> to many real-world problems because it ignores the existence of transaction costs. What are transaction costs? Typically, they're the costs of defining property rights, of enforcing contracts, of monitoring whether or not people are actually abiding by the terms of bargains that may have actually been struck in a market situation or in other bargaining contexts. According to Stiglitz, and this is a direct quote from him, Coase went wrong in assuming there are no transactions and information costs. But my central contention 
Stiglitz's contention, that is, is that these costs are pervasive. Assuming away information and transaction costs in an analysis of economic behavior in organization is like leaving Hamlet out of the play. Now, this is a very typical view people have of what Cozy's ideas are about, that they're ludicrously simplistic, can't be applied to the real world. It's also a view which is profoundly ignorant of Cozy's central ideas. It can't be emphasized enough just how ignorant the kind of statement I've just read out from Stiglitz actually is. You might even say that it demonstrates the pervasiveness of information costs. <laughs> that perhaps Stiglitz couldn't be bothered reading Cozy's work, or if he did actually read it, perhaps he suffered profound memory loss forgetting the central ideas that are actually contained in the Coase theorem. In the firm, the market, and the law, what Coase actually says on the matter of transaction costs is as follows. The reason why economists went wrong was that their theoretical system did not take into account a factor that is essential if one wishes to analyze the effect of a change in the law on the allocation of resources. This missing factor is the existence of transaction costs. The central Cosian insight is that transaction costs exist under any set of institutional arrangements, whether it's markets, governments, or anything else. And that good public policy analysis involves comparing the relevant extent of these costs under different sets of rules or institutions. The case for private ownership within this context recognizes absolutely that there are such things as market failures, that markets are not fully efficient because of the existence of transaction costs. It claims, though, that in most cases, though not necessarily all cases, these costs tend to be much lower in an environment of private ownership than they are in a context of state ownership or public ownership, whatever term you wish to use. So, for example, we can recognize that in the management of the modern day corporation, there are serious transaction costs or information costs facing shareholders in monitoring what CEOs are actually doing with the assets of the firm. And that can lead to market failures. The point, however, would be that these information and transaction costs are as nothing compared to the costs that typically face voters when they're having to monitor what politicians and regulators are doing in managing national assets or public resources. The transaction costs that face voters in monitoring politicians are far greater precisely because in most political decision-making processes, the exit option has actually been removed or eliminated in some sense. Now, the view that I've just tried to articulate, you could associate broadly with a public choice theory type of perspective. It's a kind of negative argument in favor of broadly market-based arrangements. It would recognize that there are market failures owing to transaction costs, but at the same time, it would emphasize that these costs tend to be higher in a public sector environment. And it looks at the comparison between the costs in these different sectors. It's also essentially a kind of static analysis. It recognizes that there are market failures, but it doesn't necessarily put forward a positive account of how markets might actually address some of the areas where there are these market failures. Now, it seems to me this is the area where a positive agenda for Cosian influence research actually lies. In the same way that authors who, broadly speaking, come from the Austrian school or Schumpeterian perspectives on entrepreneurship, are focused on the way in which dynamic entrepreneurial activity within a market system results in new products being created, new ideas in a competitive process, Applying those kind of ideas in the area of transaction costs suggests that we should focus on the way that dynamic entrepreneurial behavior in a market context can lead to solutions which reduce transactions costs over time through entrepreneurial <laughs> market innovations. Innovations in creating new property rights systems. Innovations in reducing the costs of enforcing and monitoring contracts. 
a public policy agenda which is focused on these sorts of ideas would look at the way in which public policy can facilitate this process of entrepreneurial development in addressing transaction cost problems and identifying the ways in which public policy can actually block <coughs> this entrepreneurial process. Now this type of an approach is what I myself tried to do several years ago in a paper that I wrote for the IEA called Liberating the Land, which looked at the land use planning issues that Rupert was referring to, where I argued that the decentralized fiscal system in the United States is much more conducive to the development of entrepreneurship in developing cozy and bargain type solutions than the land use planning system and fiscal arrangements that we have in the UK, where the nationalization of development rights effectively prohibits the very type of bargaining that Rupert was referring to. This is also, I would suggest, the type of research agenda that has influenced or did influence the writings of the late Eleanor Ostra, um, whose work is published by the IEA very recently. Ostrom's ideas on bottom-up governance solutions to collective action or common pool problems can very much be seen to be within the Cozian tradition. They look at the way in which communities of resource users are often better placed to innovate to overcome transaction cost problems than is the case when the state or even private owners take over management of particular environmental assets. This type of agenda is at the cutting edge of modern day social science, and it is ultimately a Cozian inspired agenda. I think the death of Ronald Coase is a huge loss to the world of political economy, and I've tried to show in these remarks how his ideas on transaction costs have been misrepresented, what his ideas actually are, and how we might take them forward. As they were, as they were talking, but perhaps I should just say, I, I, um, I, I must say Coase has been extremely influential uh, in my own uh, uh, thinking of writing over, over, over many years. Um, he actually is an honorary graduate at the University of Buckingham. We uh, gave him an honorary degree in the mid-1990s. I can certainly vouch uh, for Philip's point uh, that he was ex ex extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily modest and, and, uh, and very easy to approach and so on. I remember uh, Professor Keith Shaw asking him whether he realised when he was writing Problem of Social Costs that this was going to be, uh, you know, a, 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 such a tremendous thing which get him the Nobel Prize. He was he was extremely modest about it all. I mean, the, 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 the and same with his, his earlier paper on the um, on the nature of the firm. Um, he, he had no idea of all the implications that this might lead to, etc. So uh, it is um, it, he's a. Uh, I can certainly vouch for his, uh, his approachability and his greatness in, in many respects. Anyway, let me, having said all that, let me get on to the guts of the case. I, I, I was spending five minutes to, to, um, uh, to talk about uh, Coase's contribution. It's slightly difficult to structure, but I thought uh, you know, I could do it by echoing, of course, many of the things that have already been said. Um, his great contribution, this sort of conceptual breakthrough of actually thinking about transaction costs. Uh, but it seems to me... In a way, it has, uh, it's a double-edged uh, sword transaction, the notion of transaction cost. I mean, for somebody who's made his, his reputation by saying there's a cost of using the price mechanism, his most famous uh, statement in the theory of the firm, it's quite strange that we should be honouring him today, really, in, this, uh, in, the, in the IEA, so committed to the price mechanism of markets and so on. Um, it's a slightly paradoxical point until you begin to appreciate um, uh, as, Mark has as Mark and, and uh, Rupert have explained, really what he was saying. Anyway, it seems to me there are sort of two aspects to this, deriving from those two famous papers. And I, I, I'm going to call them, if you like, a sort of Hobbesian uh, policy consequence of Coase, and a Coasean policy consequence of Coase that we all use. I use these terms very, very nervously in the presence of Mark Pennington, who will probably, uh, probably upbraid me terribly. But essentially, I see this sort of theory, the nature of the firm really was concerning arrangements that were transactionally efficient. He was saying the firm is there to economize on transactions costs, actually. Um, and this, um, you know, this, this is a sort of, this is about, um, therefore, from a policy point of view, you could say, well, you know, what do we deduce from this? Well, it's, it's saying to the public sector then, if you're not careful in a sense, um, you've got to produce all these 
uh, public benefits, make sure you're transactionally efficient when you're doing it. Uh, that would be a sort of uh, public interest Coastian kind of approach, if you like. Uh, it assumes that the public, uh, the, 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 the bureaucrat, if you like, or the, or the, the decision maker is well informed, trying to pursue the public interest in good old fashioned welfare economic tradition. And you could introduce Coast to all that. Why not to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we, we are transactionally efficient here? It was, quite un, it was quite unreasonable to have all these nationalized industries, far too much. Uh, far too much internal organisation and not enough of the market. We need to bring that back. You know, you can imagine a technocrat almost saying saying that, and that that, that would be a kind of implication, if you like, which was, I, well, I called it Hobbesian. <laughs> oh, I, I'm getting nods from from uh, from Mark Pennington, so I'm very relieved about that. Um, <laughs> but of course, we on the whole uh, interpret this rather differently. Uh, well, consistently. But, but differently, we, we, we tend to concentrate obviously on then the famous 1960 problem of social cost. And uh, that is, of course, where all the confusions come in and the Stieglitz hopeless misreading of the paper and so on. Uh, and and the, the Coase theorem that, uh, well, if transactions cost were zero, and as Marcus quite rightly pointed out, the Coase the, the, was at pains to point out this was not the case, uh, but if they were, people would negotiate. Uh, to an efficient outcome, and could uh, indeed he had uh, extreme versions of the, theor uh, the theorem such that in certain very special circumstances the allocation of resources would be independent of how you assign the property rights. Anyway, uh, the point is that that that, uh, that leads then to the idea of the so-called normative coast theorem. This is where the coast theorem comes from, I suppose. That on the whole, it would be much better to have lower transactions costs than higher transactions costs, and that policy therefore should be about trying to reduce transactions costs. Um, we should remove, if you like, as it's said in some law and economics textbooks these days, we should try to remove the impediment to private agreement. That's about process. Reg we've got to have policy and regulators trying to make it easier for people to come to private bargains. That's quite a different kind of idea than we must ensure that our bureaucrats know about transactions costs and are and so structure the public sector as to as to be transactionally efficient. Um, anyway, uh, I could just, in the well, very limited time, but you could ask the question, has policy been Hobbesian or Coastian over the last uh, 30 years or so? And, uh, well, it obviously, that's a big question. Um, but if you think of, say, two major things, the privatization and the, and the tendency to contract out more of the public sector activities, I would regard that as being often, or potentially anyway, motivated by Hobbesian considerations, that essentially, uh, you're saying, well, uh, we made this terrible mistake owning all these assets. We don't need to own assets to control the economy, but we'll do it by contract, essentially. Um, and uh, indeed, I mean, one of the cases that was made powerfully for uh, privatization uh, uh, was that, um, you know, that uh, on the whole, that, that, you know, that, that, that was the point, that, uh, that you didn't need to own assets, or the state didn't need to own the assets in order to uh, in a sense, achieve almost anything they wanted to. But that, of course, is not quite what Coase is about. We tend to, and uh, Mark has explained admirably, that we tend to think of, of this as being a theorem, the normative Coase theorem, that enables information to be generated through par private bargains. So the most important thing is the normative Coase theorem coming, as I say, from the, 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 um, the paper, The Problem of Social Cost. Um, uh, but as I say, uh, how, how, whether you would interpret um, you know, privatization, a lot of contracting out as being really Coastian, it depends. I mean, you, 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 you could. I mean, it's true that people will compete then for the, tra for the, for the contracts, but nevertheless, um, it's, uh, it's not quite I think, what this was driving at. Um, you could look at this similarly with the way we structure um, regulated industries. Vertical, on the whole, we, we, you could argue that that is a sort of Coastian. Uh, um, a, a Coastian agenda trying to verti vertically to disintegrate these industries uh, uh, and generate competition, in other words, try to make private agreements and so on uh, and bargains possible at certain uh, stages, but just, just isolating the natural monopoly element and regulating that 
on along Hobbesian lines, if you like, by the, the, the hopefully well uh, well meaning um, regulator. That's one possible interpretation of it. Um, I I wonder about that even even now. I, I don't think regulators have really understood Ronald Coase's normative Coase theorem. I think they tend to think of this as a setup which is optimal. That you 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 have competition in a rather textbook sense. You know, the more the more firms are better at various levels of the of the industry, and it's only really competitive when there are as many firms as possible, and the, you know the prices, the you know, rates of return are, are, are absolutely normal, and so on. And and so you have this rather textbook price system approach to it, rather than thinking about bargains all the time, the potential for people to get together to make things better. Anyway, what about the future? Well. I mean, my conclusion would be a greater Kosian emphasis is required in terms of this um, um, the, the idea of getting rid of the impediments to private agreements. And uh, um, I can only I can only <coughs> echo what has already been said. Really, Rupert Darwell mentioned land use and so on. Ellen Ostrom has mentioned, of course, with her handling of local environmental assets. Um, I mean, I, I, I edited, edited a, a, a volume of Economic Affairs a few years ago where Steve Littlechild um, actually talked about the possibility of consumer interests getting to um, negotiate with utilities, even over the use of, of, uh, of, of natural monopoly elements, you know, network assets and so on. Um, and, you know, he argues that actually there, are, there is a considerable potential for that to happen. And that will be very revealing then. Consumers will be able to make... Uh, judgments about, um, to some extent, by their bargains, about whether certain investment programs are worthwhile and all the rest of it, rather than the regulator simply determining that. Okay, so that uh, that would be my 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 general point. That the, I mean, Coase's work is is really, um, a, 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 if you're an economist, it sort of transforms your view of things when you when you've read it. And in terms of its policy implications, they are extremely important. I don't believe that they are terribly well understood even now. I am an economist, even though Philip Booth may not think my economics is uh, up to scratch. Uh, I, I have done law, but and I've uh, written two books for the IEA on the economic approach to law. I think a, a bit unlike uh, the other speakers, I've lived with Coase for over 40 years. I was, uh, you may detect in my accent, I was educated in, in Australia. And while I, I've never met Ronald Coase, or uh, uh, did not know him, obviously, uh, I, I, he had a profound impact on my career in research. Uh, my first article I ever wrote in the early 70s was uh, an analysis of the Coase theorem. Uh, I, my master's thesis was on applying economics to accident law. I was doing a joint law economics degree. I wrote an essay on the futures contract that applied transaction cost analysis, uh, which was subsequently published because it took a different approach to the then accepted view of uh, futures trading. Um, and while I was doing administrative law <coughs> as part of my law degree, I applied Coase's, uh, uh, well, economics at least, uh, to the distinction between administrative actions and judicial actions. Um, and w why I became so interested in, in uh, Coase's analysis and the institutional economics that was developing in the 60s and 70s, and I suppose reached its high point in the 80s, was that law had no theory. Uh, I think Coase described it as stamp collecting. You know, you had a filing cabinet in which you put the cases. There was no analytical framework. But I could see quite clearly how economics could be applied to law, and a, a vast amount of research was uh, coming out on that. I want to focus on really three aspects of Coase. What he rejected of economics, what his economic approach was, and the implications or the future of Coase in economics. And as it's being pointed out, in the UK, he's relatively unknown, and his research is not, his uh, work is not really known or been applied by uh, UK economists to any great degree. He's very well known in the United States. He's led to the, the development of two separate fields of study, one which he called law and economics, which is applying economics uh, to the market to look at the legal implications. And then the economic analysis of law, which is the most cited author in that field, uh, which he really turned his back on, which is the work of Posner and lawyers principally, is saying that we can apply an efficiency analysis to uh, uh, analyse the law. Now, as uh, was mentioned, he won the Nobel Prize in 1991 uh, for his discovery and clarification of the significance of transaction costs and property rights for institutional structure and functioning of the economy. 
And he, two articles were commended that were mentioned here, The Theory of the Firm, published in 1937, and 30 years almost separating that, The Problem of Social Cost. And he's always been quite disappointed that the problem of social cost hasn't been well received or, or integrated into economics as he had hoped. And the problem with the problem of social cost is a article is has got a lot of legal cases and examples, and uh, people have focused on that and the Coase theorem, and not the central message, which is uh, the world of transaction costs. But Coase was modest. He said that the, his study of the firm and the market were his principal objective, so it was supply side economics that he was interested in. And he, he, he said on a number of occasions that the application of simple economics after he applied, he came to novel conclusions that were so simple in his view as to make them truths, uh, which were self-evident. Uh, that was not the case, uh, but that's how he felt. And I, I think as a footnote, when his economics really came from the LSC, Arnold Plant, and the uh, opportunity cost concepts that were being developed there and the research method that was developed. Coase was iconoclastic uh, and a fully made up member of the awkward squad. Uh, in, not necessarily in his demeanor and personal relationships, but intellectually. Um, as an economist, the first part of the substantive part of my discussion is that he stood against the following aspects of economics. Abstract theory, which he described as blackboard economics. He said, when economists find that they are unable to analyze what is happening in the real world, they invent an imaginary world which they are capable of handling. He was against mathematics. He said, in my youth, it was said that what was so silly to be said may be sung. In modern economics, it may be put in mathematics. <laughs> Econ econometrics, he parried it as torturing the data until it confesses. And while he accepted the man was self-interested, he was unconvinced that they were rational or that the assumption of utility maximization or rationality assisted economists. He quoted Ely Devins, an old-style English economist. He said, if economists wished to study the horse, they wouldn't go and look at a horse. They would they'd sit in their studies and say to themselves, what would I do if I were a horse? And they would soon discover that they would maximize utility. <laughs> <laughs> he would have agreed with today's behavioral economists that man is not rational, but I think they would have quickly parted ways. Posner, a colleague of Coase at Chicago and a lawyer who pushed one of Coase's insights to develop the field of economic analysis of law, accused Coase of declaring war on modern economics, letting developments in economics for the last two centuries pass him by, and this was all apparently due to his Englishness. He, uh, Posner said, he writes with the limpid prose of an accomplished English essayist, its self-conscious plainness, modesty, common sensicality, and rejection of high theory make Coase the George Orwell of modern economics. But Coase saw economics differently. Economics was defined principally by its subject matter, the working of social institutions which bind together the economic system, firms, markets. He rejected the now prevalent view of economics as a science of choice and was somewhat, which detached the subject from its, uh, sorry, detached economics from its subject matter. He disparaged his co Chicago colleagues Gary Becker, Richard Post, and to some degree George Stiglitz's attempts to colonize law, sociology, criminology, public administration, and political science. He, he unkindly said that the economists focus on these because they were incapable of explaining the economic system properly. But Coase did not reject economics or economic theory. A large amount of what he wrote was on economic theory, whether it was on the nature of the costs. And I think the element missing in the discussion so far is that he put the concept of opportunity cost firmly in the center. That's why he was so surprised that the other economists didn't accept his approach. Because even now, in today's economics, we say we put a cost function, and we mean actual costs. We don't mean opportunity costs. And that's really uh, in integrated uh, into economics. He wrote on the problems of monopoly, the marginal cost controversy, and gaps in welfare economics. Uh, he did this in plain English and without the aid of mathematics. It's not really a source of criticism, but of admiration, that he could have formulated not one but two theorems. The Coase theorem, of which he didn't like that uh, expression, but that was due to George Stigler, and the Coase conjecture to do with durability of monopolies, monopoly products and market power. He changed the minds of, in two hours, of 20 of Chicago's leading economists who thought the Coase theorem was a mistake 
He encouraged a generation of scholars to take up institutions seriously through his editorship of the Journal of Law and Economics, and he provided a launch pad of not one, but at least two major fields of research, all within his lifetime, and he capped this off as being the progenitor of the use of market methods to allocate radio spectrum, which generated billions for government, unintended consequence, and liberated, amongst other services, mobile telephony, is quite astounding. And he retired, effectively, I think over 50 years ago. <laughs> Ronald Coase was a classical liberal economist in the tradition of Adam Smith and Alfred uh, Marshall. And he was also influenced by Arnold Plant at the LSE in the 30s and 40s. Coase's view of economics was clear. It was a study of the firm and markets. He adopted this supply-side uh, approach, and his uh, speech, Nobel acceptance speech, was entitled The Institutional Nature of Production. His building blocks were transactions, Gains from trade, but not game theory, in total as opposed to marginal analysis. And he said markets traded principally not in goods and services, but legal rights. He replaced the fiction of a perfectly competitive market, where there could be no market fa failure, as he established in the problem of social costs, with the one where transaction costs were rife, which he has to, it has to be said he didn't define or adequately study himself. His empirical approach was the case study with its detailed analysis of how business and regulation operated in practice. It parado paradoxically has more in common with legal analysis, and he did law it, and the business school. And his theory of the firm is actually much more, probably more taught in business schools than it is uh, as the core of the economics of the firm, modern economics of the firm. He said, an inspired theoretician might do well without such empirical work, but my feeling is that the inspiration is most likely to come through the stimulus provided by patterns puzzles and anomalies revealed by the systematic gathering of data, particularly when the prime need is to break out of our existing habits of thought. And Coase's policy framework is the notion of opportunity cost, which he compares the total product obtainable with alternative social arrangements. And his approach is not to start with a model, but to start our analysis with the situation approximating that which actually exists, to examine the effects of a proposed policy change, and to attempt to decide whether a new situation would be better in total than the old. So what are the implications of this framework that Coase has uh, put together? And I've just given you a, a helicopter view of uh, some very subtle analysis that he engaged in. First, it has to be appreciated that Coase was not a policy wonk, to use the, uh, today's expression. He turned his back on antitrust, for example, which he taught at the University of Chicago because he felt it forced economists to develop quick fixes. Uh, yet, one of his most influential pieces was the reaction to bad government policy, and after waiting 67 years, was the foundation of a market solution to spectrum allocation that we've discussed already. Coase's work on spectrum markets was badly received by fellow economists and policymakers. The Rand Corporation, internal reaction to a draft report they commissioned from Coase and several other uh, economists. One of the internal reviewers wrote, I know of no country on the face of the globe except a few corrupt Latin American dictatorships where the sale of spectrum could even be seriously proposed. Another said it was a waste of RAN resources. I think the point of uh, quoting that is the resistance he found and that what he was saying, uh, you know, 50 years ago, uh, was quite uh, dramatic. Today, you know, it's been incorporated somewhat into uh, mainstream economics. Uh, Coase's lessons for economists are don't believe other economists and immerse oneself in the details of the subject you are studying. Don't subject, substitute technique for subject matter and a real understanding. Write in plain English. On, if you write something and you think it's pure genius, wait 30 to 60 years for it to be recognized as such, or, as he put it more prosaically, uh, 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 probably running out of time, I'm not going to quote him there. Coase advocated that the economics be more microanalytical, to use Williamson's phrase, who developed his transaction cost approach into uh, uh, a variant uh, and won the Nobel Prize uh, for that with uh, Eleanor Ostrom as a co-winner. Uh, he said, satisfactory views on policy can only come from a patient study of how, in practice, the market firms and governments handle the problem of harmful effects. Economists need to study the work of the broker in bringing parties together, the effectiveness of restrictive covenants, the problems of large-scale real estate development companies, 
the operation of government zoning and other regulating activities. It is my belief that economists and policymakers generally have tended to overestimate the advantages which come from government regulation, but this belief, even if justified, does not do more to make than to suggest that government regulation should be curtailed. It does not tell us where the boundary line should be drawn. This, it seems to me, has to come from a detailed investigation of the actual result of handling the problem in different ways. And when he was still an active academic, his, his proposed major research project of business was to study business contracts to come and see how businessmen got together and uh, resolved this issue. Coase's uh, approach put institutions and laws at the center of analysis of markets and firms, both, both in understanding these and developing market-based solutions based on the fine property rights. Coase, I think, was too hard on the economic analysis of law, which he turned his back on and left to lawyers. And I think he had a point that lawyers would probably have a comparative advantage of applying an economics to law, that is, lawyers trained in economics. While they may have... Uh, the, the Chicago approach uh, pushed by his colleagues, Bork, Easterbrook and Posner and Stigler, applying econ elementary price to revolutionize antitrust competition law and economics, turning what was in the 60s and 70s described by Posner as an intellectual disgrace to a more rational body of law. As notwithstanding Coase, we need to have more detailed studies of institutions, ex post evaluations of their performance, and more understanding of the regulatory and market processes. In conclusion, I think uh, that uh, one of the areas that does require a lot of attention, and unfortunately it is one, although transaction costs were at the heart of Coase's analysis, he never paid too much attention to, uh, because if you read Coase carefully, the transaction cost concept is really a theoretical concept. It is the frictions in a perfectly com competitive market that stop it from reaching a so-called optimal or efficient solution. But what we have today is an economy riddled with physical and man-made transaction costs. The rise of the profession, service industries, government regulation, the financial sector seem to throw sand in the gears of uh, economic activity and distort economic activity. And it is arguable that the whole legal accounting and financial services industries are example of transaction costs. <laughs> Coase did not contribute, but uh, he accepted that economics does not provide an answer, answer even when the economic evidence is clear. He was fond of quoting Frank H. Knight, a fellow traveler and famous economist, although probably not well known today, that so often emphasized problems of welfare economics must ultimately dissolve into a study of aesthetics and morals. I'm going to actually give a practical policy example of how important Coase's thinking is. And I'm going to turn to one of my <laughs> favourite subjects, which is the railways, unsurprisingly. Uh, now, the railways were, of course, privatised in the 1990s, but this privatisation process didn't work out as well as it perhaps should have done. And I think that can be partly explained because policymakers, um, to some extent, neglected the lessons of Coase's work. Um, now, privatisation was a success in many ways, and um, to the extent that um, the private firms were unhindered by um, very heavy regulation, they, they did improve things like marketing, price segmentation, um, load management, and so on. And this helped to deliver the big increase in rail usage we've seen over the last 15 years. I mean, a good example of that is the, the, the introduction of these very low-cost fares on off-peak into city services. So, uh, the the commercialisation did make it an enormous difference. It, it wasn't all bad news, but nonetheless there was a major problem here, and that was that the, um, the level of subsidy from the taxpayer increased enormously. So it went up from around two billion a year in real terms in current prices in the late 1990s to around uh, seven billion a year in recent years. So it's, it's more than trebled in real terms. Um, now, part of that was due to um, a change in policy, so the government moved away from the long-term policy of uh, managed decline that had been uh, on the railways from the 50s to the, to the 1980s, and, and moved towards rail being the core of transport policy, and they wanted a, a big modal shift from, from cars to public transport, and rail was really at the heart of that. And I think that probably explains around and two-thirds of the increase in subsidy, that, that, that massive sea change in policy to uh, build very expensive new capacity um, and subsidise more services and so on. But I think to explain the other third of the increase in subsidies, you actually have to turn to, to the lessons from Coase. Um, so in this um, groundbreaking 1937 paper, The Nature of the Firm, um, Coase asked why so many economic activities are conducted 
within the firm, within the hierarchy, rather than in open markets. Um, I mean, it, it, if you think about it, it is theoretically possible to um, conduct most of these activities through subcontracting rather than in-house. So he's trying to ask you know, why, so, why so many of these activities are, are done within the internal hierarchy in the firm. I mean, what he was actually trying to work out was why there's so much variation in what's called vertical integration from um, sector to sector and from firm to firm. Um, and this is actually critical to understanding what went wrong with um, rail privatisation. Um, because um, when the railways uh, originally developed in the private sector, they were nearly always um, subject to a very high degree of vertical integration. But interestingly, it didn't actually start off like that. So... Um, if you look at the first, if you like, modern-style railway, which was um, the Stockton and Darlington, uh, opened by George Stevenson in um, 1825, this actually had an open access model, so just about anybody could purchase the, the wagons and, and so on, vehicles, and then they could pay an access fee and, and trundle on the railway carrying passengers or freight. But this actually turned into a disaster because you had a huge disputes between the different drivers of these, of these miniature trains, it often ended up with fist fights and the line being closed. And so it didn't work out very well. And within just a few years, you had complete vertical integration with uh, Stevenson's firm um, owning both the tracks and running all the trains. So they'd had enough of all the fights and they said, we're just going to run it all ourselves. Um, and all the other you know, railways more or less followed suit and, and moved towards vertical integration. But move forward to the 1990s, and the architects of rail privatisation um, largely neglected these historical lessons. And I don't think they'd really grasped um, transaction cost economics in, in perhaps the detail that was needed. Though they, did, they did reference it at the time, but I don't, don't think they'd really, perhaps not aware of some of the, the later literature by Williamson and so on. Um, so they ended up going back to a structure that was actually pretty similar in basic terms to, to the tried and failed one that George C. Stevenson had used in, in the 1820s. Um, so you had um, you know, a fragmentation between track and train, a hugely complex structure. But we didn't have fist fights between the different rail firms. Uh, we, instead, we had you know, these vast layers of bureaucracy that, uh, if you like, to manage the interactions between the different layers within the rail industry. So you have armies of bureaucrats, expensive lawyers, accountants and consultants who would um, agree these hugely complex contracts between the train operators and the franchising of X, Y, Z. And of course, as, as we've heard already, uh, these are an example of transaction costs, uh, what, what Coase identified um, back in the 1930s. And it seems that on most railways, these transaction costs are particularly high and tend to outweigh the, the costs associated with vertical integration, because clearly all things being equal, it's better to have the, have the benefits of uh, open market transactions, but it isn't always the case. Um, now, why are the railways, um, why is there this tendency on the railways towards vertical integration? Well, I think um, uh, Williamson's really you know, got into this in a great deal of detail, but it, it, it sort of boils down to the very high level of mutual in, interdependence between the track owner and the train operators, and also the need for very uh, long-term contracts and very long-term um, capital investments and a recent example was the upgrade of the West Coast Main Line where because the obviously there are huge risks in these kind of projects and because uh, the spec final specifications were slightly different from the original ones uh, the basically the track owners couldn't recover the costs from the train operators because they hadn't had exactly adhered to the contract and that's an example of the, the kind of problems you get if you don't have vertical integration uh, and that would have been avoided and, under a vertical integration system. The fact that the trains didn't go quite as fast as they originally envisaged wouldn't have been such a massive problem. And they wouldn't have had to basically uh, rescind the original agreement. So, um, so you know, having looked at this, it hasn't worked out well. What can policymakers do to, to make the structure of the rail industry more efficient? And most importantly, to cut the cost to taxpayers. Um, but I think the main point is that officials should, should reject the fatal conceits that are... Uh, an opti optimal industry structure can be imposed from above. Um, instead, they should learn from Coase that the level of vertical integration is just another market process, and there will be mergers, there will be demergers, and so on, and this will tend towards the most efficient structure in the long run. So I think, basically, um, drawing on Coase's lessons, privatisation should be revisited, but this time it should be done properly, transfer the railways to the private sector, and then, basically, leave them alone.
Um, let firms themselves decide how much to integrate track and train.